Hello, welcome to this webinar. We're going to be talking about gender identity issues and kids and talking about how do we serve our kids in crisis and the ones that are struggling with this particular issue. And so we're going to take a, a really big picture approach at first to try to understand the issue. And then we will dial it down maybe a little more towards um, dealing with kids and knowing how to navigate this as a church. And so we are going to get started. Um, let me start with a case study that you may have experienced in your church or you may eventually experience, but this has happened uh, in many churches. But it says uh, Elliot is a 10 year old biological biological boy who said he wishes he were a girl. And you notice as the children's minister that he begins to dress like a girl and grow his hair out to look even more like a girl. After about six months passes, it becomes increasingly difficult for people who do not know him to know that he's actually a boy because he is taking on the identity of a girl so convincingly. It all comes to a head when his parents request he be able to attend a girls only lock in at the church and you are the children's minister and you're faced with the decision, how am I going to handle this? And so what would you do? Uh, I think this, this particular case study sort of brings to light the issues that we are dealing with that are new uh, and that are certainly something that we hadn't, didn't have to worry about or, or address in, in many years past. So we're going we're gonna to talk about it. We, we are not going to give you the answer to this because I think every uh, church is going to be a little bit different in how they handle it. And there's certainly some different approaches of how to handle it. But let's talk about how did we get to this point in our world where this becomes such a big issue. And there's probably many reasons, but I've sort of outlined three. One would be conflicting worldviews. The second would be expressive individualism or hyper individualism is another word. And the other one is normalization. So if we look at conflicting worldviews, um, we know that according to the world, uh, truth is relative and that experiences and feelings determine beliefs and, and many times truth. Okay, and we also know that our world is teaching our kids that they are their own authority. Now that bumps up against the biblical worldview because we believe that truth is absolute and that absolute truths are found in the Bible and that as Christians, God is our authority. And so our kids are immersed in a world though that's sending them these messages and not only our kids, but also our parents. If we look at expressive individualism or hyper individualism, we know that authenticity and autonomy are really big um, words um, for folks and that there is a pushback at any, att at any attempt to question a person's uh, view of themselves. And, and while those are issues, I think the last one is probably the hardest one for us as Christians. And it's this idea that if you love me, that you will affirm whatever I want to be and whatever and whoever I say that I am. And so it makes it very difficult for us as Christians, if maybe we don't agree with, with a lifestyle or with a choice, um, it's often painted as hatred um, instead of we can love people and disagree with them. And so I think that's the tricky part for us as Christians. We've got to remind people, we've got to teach our kids that we can love someone and disagree. Uh, and so expressive individualism or hyper individualism. The third thing would be normalization. Um, everywhere we look, this has become very much a normalized issue. Um, and really it's painted more as a diversity issue uh, than anything. But gender questions on forms, if you're filling anything out, you recognize and you know now that there's multiple choices besides male and female. Um, the sort of the emergence of gender neutral bathrooms. Uh, and then there's also sort of a, a movement. Uh, I don't think it's gotten as big as, as what maybe some people thought it might, but gender neutral parenting that says, you know what, we're not going to tell our kids uh, what they are or who they are. We're going to let them decide as they age. And so things have been normalized. Um, and so those are kind of three, three things that I think have brought us to, to where we are today. Certainly there's other things, but those would, be, those would be my three things that I would say. And so as we think about this issue, I think that one of the mistakes that we can make is to, to not be educated in it, to not sort of know the terminology and to understand it. Um, because we know that um, 
that parents who have kids who are struggling with this, they're, they are seeking out information. And so we don't want to speak unintelligently about it. We want to know the terminology and want to know what we're dealing with. So I've got some terms up here, um, and, and some of them are very familiar, and maybe some of them are new to you. But um, it used to be that a person's biological sex and their gender were considered the same thing, right? The biological sex is, is who you are as a person, the parts, the body parts that you have, the chromosomes, the DNA. But then gender is more of this psychological, social, cultural aspect of being male, male or female. And gender identity issues have really tried to split those things into two and say, you know, physically you could be this way but emotionally and mentally you might be a different way, okay? And so gender identity is really a severing of those two things. Gender dysphoria is the, uh, the term or the diagnosis that a psychologist, psychiatrist would use for a person who experiences a lot of discomfort and distress because they feel as though there's a mismatch between their biological sex and their gender identity. Um, intersex, is a new word that I didn't know, um, but uh, it is when a baby is born and they're not able to be distinctly identified as male or female, okay? And so there's a very small percentage of kids, of babies that are born, that it, there has to be a decision made one way or the other. Sometimes it re requires surgery in terms of which um, sex to pursue. Okay, and so I've taught this material in a lot of places, and I've had I've had one parent come up and say, "Yes, my child was born this way," and we had to make that very difficult decision. And so that that opens up my brain a little bit more to what some of our parents and kids are dealing with um, that maybe I didn't know before. Um, and then transgender is a word that you've heard; it's kind of an umbrella term um, that is used to describe people whose gender is not the same as or does not sit comfortably with the sex they were assigned at birth. And so these are the terminologies that you will you will be hearing. Um, and I wanted you to be aware of those as we move through this presentation. So one of the things that we know is that there's a lot of voices speaking into our parents and there's a lot of voices speaking into our kids. And three of those voices that I just want to briefly touch on are the American Academy of Pediatricians, the American Psychiatric Association, and the American College of Pediatricians. And so each one of them kind of have a different take on this. Um, and if I were to, to sort of put these folks in a camp or in a tribe, which I don't really like to do, but the American Academy of Pediatricians would be a much more liberal group. Um, and they're a much larger group. And when they make policy statements uh, on things like gender identity, um, there's, a, there's a group of people, a board, 18 to 20 people who speak for for all of the pediatricians. Um, the American College of Pediatricians is on the other end of the spectrum, much more conservative, and any sort of policy statement that they make requires a 80% um, uh, vote in, affirm in affirming that particular policy statement. And so um, it requires a lot, more, um, a lot more consensus and is much more uh, conservative. Um, and so the American Psychiatric Association is going to definitely lean more liberal, um, but even they um, say some things that might be helpful for us as we think about this issue. But let's look at, at what each of those actually say. So the American Academy of Pediatricians is, is a much larger group and a much more liberal group. And just to sort of summarize it, they would affirm a child's desire to sort of go down that path of exploration of being a different sex than what they are. And so they would be in favor of um, any sort of medical care to help them with that. Um, they also don't believe that binary defin definitions of gender are necessarily reflective of, of, the, of the kids that, that they serve. Um, and they believe that if there's a mental health stigma that it re or a mental health issue, it's really from the stigma of it. And so they're going to be affirming of kids, um, of giving them things like puberty blockers and then eventually cross-sex hormones um, to sort of let them uh, consider moving in that direction. Okay, so um, then we have the American Psychiatric Association. And again, they trend more liberal, um, but they say this, which I think is helpful. They say, you know, early social transition, which we're talking about kids, 
elementary age kids prior to pu puberty, essentially, um, should be approached with caution um, to avoid foreclosing this stage of gender identity development. Because if, if a child, as a, as a very young child, begins to, to go down that road to explore being a different gender, and they get to a point when they go, you know what, that's not really what I wanted, that there's a lot of distress in turning back to the, to the original biological sex. And so what they would say is, let's be really careful about allowing kids to go down that road because we know that if they get to that point, which many of them will, um, and I'll show you some statistics on that, it's going to be very hard for them to turn and go back to um, their, their biological sex. And so that's the American Psychiatric Association. The American College of Pediatricians, remember that's the more conservative group, and they, they say something completely different than the uh, American Pediatric uh, folks, American Academy of Pediatrics. They say that conditioning children into believing a lifetime, and it is a lifetime, of chemical and surgical impersonation of the opposite sex is normal and helpful is actually child abuse. So they, they come out really strong against allowing children to make that transition. They say that young children are being permanently sterilized and surgically maimed under the guise of treating a condition that will otherwise resolve in about 80% of them, and they believe that's criminal. Okay, so one of the things to, to recognize is that um, once you move into the cross-sex hormones, most all people are permanently sterilized and unable to have kids in the future. And so it's very important that we understand that we're, we're letting very young children make decisions that will really impact their reproductive health in the future. Okay, so American College of Pediatricians comes down on a different viewpoint. So our, our parents are sort of stuck in this world that's sending them mixed messages, but probably the groups that get the loudest voice in our world are the American Academy of Pediatricians and the American Psychiatric Association. So one of the things that I really think is important for parents and for you as children's ministers to know is that there's been a lot of studies done and that most of those studies show that many, um, up to 98% of boys and 88% of girls in one study um, eventually work through this after they naturally pass through puberty. Okay, another study followed 139 seven-year-old boys and after 13 years, only 17 of those still said that they felt they were girls or had doubts about their gender identity. Vanderbilt and London's Portman Clinic said 70 to 80 percent of kids who reported transgender feelings spontaneously lost those feelings without medical or surgical treatment. So we have several studies that show that most kids are going to work through this after naturally passing through puberty. Okay, It's important to know a couple things. Number one, there's still a percentage of kids that will not work through this even after puberty. Okay, and so as, as Christians, as children's ministers, you know, we've got to be aware that while most will work through it, some will not. And we've got to determine how we're going to minister to those families. And, and that's a very real issue to them, very real issue to them. Um, and so it's also important to realize that if, if we support or if pediatricians support giving puberty blockers, which basically presses pause on puberty, um, which is a sort of a common thing now for kids who may feel like they need to explore being a different gender. Um, when you do that, you're taking away the very thing that could help them. And so if they don't, if they're not allowed to naturally pass through puberty, we won't know if they're part of that larger group, the majority group, that will actually work through it. And so we, we need to be aware of those things and we, we need parents to be aware of those statistics and those things. Um, we also need to remember that they're kids. Um, I'm speaking mainly about children. I'm not speaking about um, 18, 19, 20, 20 year olds. I'm talking about children. What we know is that um, kids and teenagers um, can have some, some faulty beliefs, right? We don't we, we think back to the things that we thought when we were younger and we go, oh, wow, I'm glad that I didn't make all these big life decisions when, 
when I wasn't thinking as clearly as maybe I do now. And so there's some faulty beliefs that our kids are being fed. And, and one of them is that normal puberty stressors, which I think all of us would agree puberty is awkward and weird. Um, but what they're being told is if that feels awkward and weird to you, that's probably proof that you're transgender. So we want to be careful about those faulty beliefs that they may have. They may also be told that the only path to happiness is transition. Um, and then they also may be told that anyone who disagrees with the plan uh, is transphobic, abusive, and shouldn't be in their life. You know, it's kind of that us versus them mentality. And so we want to recognize that kids don't always think clearly. Um, we also want to remember uh, that their their judgment center of their brain is the last part of their brain to develop. And so um, the frontal cortex is where we want kids making decisions, uh, and yet that's not where, where they are. Um, the frontal cortex is able to, to make good long-term decisions, is able to weigh long-term consequences, and, and our kids are operating more from the back part of their brain. And so, again, we need to, we need to know that, that the kids that are being allowed or encouraged to make some of these life-altering decisions, their brain is not fully developed and they're not quite ready to even make those decisions. Um, we also want to recognize some of the alarming outcomes. Um, the statistics show that um, after sex reassignment, individuals have a considerably higher risk for mortality, suicidal behavior, and psychiatric morbidity than the general population. Um, we also know that suicide mortality rose almost 20 times above that, the non-transgender population. And then the last one is startling as well. The rate of lifetime suicide attempts across all ages of transgender individuals is 41% compared to under 5% in the overall U.S. population. So that last statistic can be used as a, as, as a weapon really for for lots of different sides. Um, for, for those who would, um, who would affirm this and say, um, yes, kids should be able to do these things, what they might say to us as Christians is, well, of course that statistic is so high. It's because you all reject them. It's because you all hate them. And so they kind of use that statistic to point back to us and say, we're part of the reason that those kids do it. Now, as Christians, we may, we may do something with that statistic that's equally as hurtful, and we may say to that person well, or to that group, well, of course it's that high because it didn't make them happy in sort of, sort of a non-empathetic response. So as Christians, I think the response we have to have is, wow, these kids are so vulnerable. We've got to minister to them. We've got to figure out how to help them. Um, because obviously a 41% uh, suicide attempt rate is unacceptable to us. And so the outcomes are something that we need to take into consideration. Um, and so how do we respond to that? I think there are three responses that we need to consider. First of all, there's a theological response, there's an individual family response, and then there's a church response. So when we think about it theologically, we know that we live in the tension of a fallen world and that we've got to balance grace and truth. And honestly, none of us are really good at that. We either, we either fall more towards the grace side and don't speak any truth, um, or we fall so hard to the truth side that we have no love and no grace. And so we've got to balance that. We've got to know the scriptures. We need to remember scriptures. We know in Genesis 1, 27, that the, the original intention of God's creation was a binary creation. It's how each one of us got here, right? Male and female, God created them that way. We also know that in the womb, God knows us. He plans for us. He has a plan for us. He knit us together in the womb. And we also know that in the New Testament, Jesus said, don't cause these children to stumble. And so there's, there's several scriptures, I think, that help us think about this. And we know the original intention was a binary creation. However, we live in a fallen world. Um, and one book that I've found helpful, and uh, you, you may find other books, um, but is called God and the Transgender Debate. And um, he, he talks a lot about Genesis 1 through 3. Um, and and he, he says, you know, um, the sense of gender being severed from biological sex is really a product of the fall. Uh, because in that sense, 
We are all born that way because we're distorted versions of our created selves. In other words, our bodies and our minds are not aligning like they would in a sinless world. And so what he would say is this is, this is not really a new thing. This is something that, that people have struggled with because of the fall. We have things in our bodies and in our minds um, that, that, weren't, um, that weren't designed that way. Um, and he points out that the deceptive proposal from Satan centered around denying God's authority, depicting God's rules as unfair and restrictive, and promising pleasure and enlightenment, which is a lot of the same lies in a lot of different things that the world tells us, right? And he also points out that after the fall, the very first result of the first rejection of God is that people felt awkward of and ashamed of their bodies. And so in his in his uh, book, he kind of points out that this is this is not necessarily something new, although it's a different way of experiencing um, the the effects of the fall. Um, within he also provides a about a 20 minute sermon on this and i'll provide this powerpoint to to the folks for you all if you want it and you can listen to that he kind of unpacks it i don't really have time to unpack it completely today um, but i think uh, that might those are kind of a few little handlebars that maybe we could put put on our on our thought process with this so how do we think about an individual and a family response? First of all, we've got to respond rather than react. We have to listen. Um, there, there's a lot of different reasons why a, a child might be struggling with this. And if we want to influence the child or the parent, we have to understand what it is they're experiencing. And so first of all, we have to be willing to sit down and listen. We have to love. We have to balance that grace and truth. And then we have to help parents to realize that leading our kids um, is what we're, we're called to do, and that guidance is not rejection. That sometimes as parents, we, we help guide our kids away from things or to things, and this issue is no different. We also need to help empower parents. Parents need to engage in the conversation. They need to be equipped, and we need to extend resources, and I have a few of those that I can share with you all as well. But I think the, the time for parents to think about the issue and how they would respond is before it happens. Um, because once, once it happens, it's very difficult to think as critically and as carefully as you can when you're not emotionally uh, involved in it um, as significant. So um, what is in the best interest of the child? Um, I think that's a question that we have to ask. Um, and um, Leonard Sachs has written quite a bit about gender and kids, and he says that we need to have a long look based on our understanding of childhood and adolescent development. Uh, development. In other words, we need to remember that how they feel today is not probably not going to be how they feel tomorrow or the next year or the next year, and that they are in a process of holistic development, that their brains are not fully developed, and that when in doubt, we need to err on the side of just normal variation. Um, there is a, a, a range of variation in how we experience ourselves as male or female. And unfortunately, I think the world and even the church is more comfortable with, with a tomboy girl, gives more, a little more grace and a little more room for that than a feminine, feminine boy. And so we've got to help kids understand that that um, there, there, there are girls who are extremely feminine and you know only want to wear dresses and high heels and makeup and all those things. And then there are girls who want to be outside and do sports and do fishing and all those things. And then there's a lot of girls uh, somewhere on that spectrum and all of that is okay. And so we want to help kids understand there's some variation in how we experience ourselves. Um, we want to recognize that parents are really still the greatest influence, and if we want to address this issue, we probably need to work through parents. Um, Sack says at the end of his, he says, you know, gender affirmation, which basically says we're going to affirm whatever gender a child feels, um, is a triumph of ideology over reality or feelings over facts. And so we want to always be thinking about what's in the best interest of the child. And I think even Christians and non-Christians, based on some of the information that I've given you, the statistics, the outcomes, um, and thinking long term, 
most of most of us, I feel like, could come together and understand that we need to think long term about kids and not let them make these these heated decisions that could literally impact the rest of their life in a negative way. So what is a church response? And this is where it gets tricky and that goes back to that case study, right? Um, Jim Garlow said, a time is coming when the government will demand that churches accept and promote an understanding of sexuality and gender that directly opposes God's word. And he, he said that several years ago and I think that's kind of where we are um, because our world is really wanting to, to push this issue as a diversity issue, as a diversity issue. And there, there are some dangers for us as a church if we don't address these things from our, from our core beliefs. Okay, so it shows up in children's and student ministry at gender-based events like the girls lock in, at gender-based groupings. Some churches are grappling with, do we still have gender-based groupings? with bathroom usage and with camps and retreats. Those are really the, the, the places that it shows up and you've got to decide how you're going to handle that. So one of the ways to, to handle that sort of in advance is to have some policies that you, that you determine. Um, so a statement of faith is super important for every church where you are literally outlining what your church believes and your core beliefs and you're backing those up with scripture and then out of those come the policies but another thing that you would need to have is a religious employment criteria if this is something that that um, would would be a problem for an employee to to transition then you need to make sure that your your employment uh, criteria backs up what your beliefs are a facility use policy, a formal membership policy, a marriage policy, and um, Alliance Defending Freedom uh, has some good re resources for that. But your policies really flow out of, though, your statement of faith. And so here's, here's how you might sort of figure out how you're going to handle some of these unique situations like the case study. Okay, so first of all, you're going to define your core beliefs about gender, sexuality, and marriage, and you're going to be very explicit and you're going to cite corresponding biblical text to support those beliefs. Um, and then once you have those in place, the way in which you live out those beliefs is in a protected religious freedom. So then you develop your policies to reflect those core beliefs. Where the problem comes in is if you have policies that aren't backed up by your core beliefs, then it's not a religious issue, religious freedom issue. So here's a very simple policy that some churches have have uh, adapted or adopted and there's a blank and that's the church name will always consider a person's biological sex to be their assigned gender for purposes of ministry placement okay so that's a policy statement um, that allows you to operate within maybe your your core beliefs um, of course you would always want to enlist um, the services of an attorney um, and you would want to make sure that uh, everything that you were putting in place um, was approved by your church legal team. Um, so that th there's some forethought that has to go into place before you're ready to answer that case study. Uh, that particular case study happened in a local church. They had nothing in place, and it really turned into a very difficult thing. Um, and so one of the things that I would say is that you've got two two issues here. Okay, you've got to you've got to figure out how you're going to manage this issue. How are you going to what are your policies going to say? How are you going to approach a case study like that? But but more importantly, how are you going to minister in this issue? And and what I would say is for every hour that you spend trying to figure out how you're going to manage this issue, that you spend 5 hours trying to think about how are you going to minister in this issue? Because these kids who are experiencing this um, it is it is their reality and it is difficult and we have to be willing to continue that relationship develop that relationship and to minister through that I can tell you that parents who have kids who go through this it's very difficult because the world tells them hey if you don't embrace this your kids gonna be one of those who commit suicide and so it becomes and it feels like this this really um, difficult decision to make and, and parents need help and they don't they don't need the church to turn their back on them right 
And so we, as children's ministers, have to figure out how it is that we're going to minister to them. And I think maybe one of the first steps that we do is we educate ourselves and we educate our parents. And then we begin to talk about how can we help kids? Because there's all kinds of questions. There's the question of pronouns. There's the questions of names. Um, and all of those have to be fleshed out through your individual churches. That's a reflection of what you believe and what your policies state. Thank you for spending some time with me today. I know this is not a, a fun issue, but it's certainly an issue that we need to think about so that we can help kids who are going through this crisis.